So thanks, everybody. Um, welcome to part one of Beginner's Crash Course to Elasticstack. Again, I'm Lisa Jung, and I'm a developer advocate at Elastic. So today I'm going to give you a crash course on Elasticsearch and Kibana. So before we get started, let's kick this off with a question. So who here has ever used the Elastic Stack before? So in the chat window, type yes if you have used it and type no if you have never used it. I'm gonna give you guys about 10 seconds to answer. Okay. So it seems like there are actually a lot of people in the audience that have never used it before. But even so, you may be using a lot of apps with certain features that are powered by the Elastic Stack. So for example, if you've ever searched for a ride on Uber, Elastic is the engine that powers the Uber marketplace that connects you to the driver. And if you ever had mad cravings for tacos and were searching for open restaurants on Yelp, Elastic is powering that search. So it's hidden under a lot of the apps and websites that you use on a daily basis, which few of them are shown here. So what is the Elastic stack exactly? Now, if you're a developer working with data, the Elastic Stack is a great tool to have on your belt. And it consists of four products, Beats, Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. And with the stack, you can take data from any source in any format, then search, analyze, and visualize in real time. So some of the most popular use cases for the Elastic Stack are logging, metrics, security analytics, and business analytics. For example, the Elastic Stack is used to store and analyze log data. In a specific example for all the gamers out there, Blizzard uses the Elastic Stack to analyze gamer and server events. So if the players experience a slowdown or an error, their monitoring team would use the Elastic Stack to figure out what's causing it. Now it could also be used to gather metrics. And one of my favorite examples is the Mars Curiosity rover. And it sends telemetry, sensor, photo data into the Elastic Stack for analysis. So if someone wanted to know how hot Mars is on an hourly basis, you can go and pull the data. Now with the Elastic Stack, you could analyze security issues and threats within an environment as well. So you probably have used Slack at work or at meetups before. And what you may have not realized is that Slack uses the Elastic Stack and their security operations center to secure communications through their channels. Now, lastly, if you have ever used Tinder, you probably didn't realize that the Elastic Stack was helping you find your match. So this is a technology behind using geolocations to match people together. And it's also used to analyze business needs and build custom applications so you could analyze and learn from the data. So for example, Tinder relies on the Elastic Stack to analyze and predict which people a user will swipe right on or which people will swipe right on that user and when there is a match. So all of these use cases are made possible by the Elastic Stack. And with the stack, you can take data from any source in any format, then search, analyze, and visualize it in real time. And it's a collection of four products. So first we have Elasticsearch, which is the heart of the Elastic Stack. And it allows you to store, search, and analyze your data. Then we have Kibana, which is a visualization tool. And it's a UI that helps you visualize and explore data in Elasticsearch. Now, in order for us to work with data, we need to get data into Elasticsearch, right? And this is where Beats and Logstash come into play. So Beats are lightweight data shippers that push data into Elasticsearch. And if you need to parse and enrich your data before pushing data into Elasticsearch, then you would use Logstash. So Beginner's Crash Course is a series of workshop. And throughout the series, we'll delve into each product, learn when to use it, and how to use it. So by the end of the series, you can identify which product of the Elastic Stack would best serve your use case and know how to get started with these products. So today I'm gonna to introduce you to Elasticsearch and Kibana. So here's the game plan. And we'll start off by going over a scenario where Elasticsearch and Kibana could come in handy. Then we'll go over the basic architecture of Elasticsearch. 
Then we'll wrap up by running CRUD operations with Elasticsearch and Kibana. So let's get started. Now, Elasticsearch is known as the heart of the Elastic Stack. And I said this like a million times, but this is where you could store, search, and analyze your data. So let's go over a scenario where Elasticsearch may come in handy. Now, imagine you're the lead developer responsible for building and maintaining an online grocery shop. And using the search bar, millions of customers will be searching for products that they want to buy. Now, a great search experience is key to have your customers to buy and keep coming back to your platform. And we want the customers to get fast and relevant results no matter the scale. Now, another important factor in search experience is relevancy. I mean, the whole point of search is finding relevant data fast, and we want to be able to fine tune our search experience to get the information we want. And we also want most relevant results at the top and the least relevant at the bottom. So for example, let's say a customer is searching for peanut butter and there are a ton of different brands. But what if a customer wanted to see peanut butter from highest to lowest rated brands? Or what if the customer is searching for sriracha hot sauce and misspells it? We still wanna pull up relevant search results even though the customer is spelling doesn't exactly match the product data. So if you're in a situation where speed and relevance of your search is an important aspect of your work, Elasticsearch could come in really handy. So how does it look when Elasticsearch is connected to your app? Well, when a user sends a search request from your website, the request is sent to the server, which sends a search request to Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch finds and sends the results back to the server, which processes the info and sends the results back to the browser. Now, let's go even go one step further. So through your app, you're collecting a lot of data, such as order information, purchase history, the list goes on and on. And we want to make use of that data. For example, we want to know what was the revenue for the last month or which products are most popular. So to answer these questions, you can enter relevant data into Elasticsearch, so you can search and analyze your data to answer your question. But data is so much easier to understand if you could visualize it. And this is where Kibana comes in, which helps you to visualize and manage your data. So think of Kibana as a web interface to the data stored in Elasticsearch. It allows you to search, view, and interact with your Elasticsearch data. So if you had a question about what is the most popular product or what was our revenue last month, you would enter relevant data in, in, into Elasticsearch and from Kibana, send requests to the Elasticsearch to get and analyze the data you want. Now, on top of that, you'll be able to create a dashboard with Kibana so you could visualize data in a variety of charts, tables, and maps. And this way, you can gain insights more easily and be able to share that with your stakeholders. So if you're in a situation where you need to analyze and visualize data inside Elasticsearch, Kibana will come in really handy. Okay, so now that you understand when to use Elasticsearch in Kibana, we'll move on to the basic architecture of Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is a powerful search and analytics engine, and it's known for its distributed nature, speed, and scalability. And this is due to its unique architecture. So when Elasticsearch is up and running, you now have an instance of Elasticsearch, also known as Node. And each node has unique ID and a name. And it belongs to a single cluster. And we'll get to what that is in a bit. Now, when you start up a node, a cluster is formed automatically. And you can have one to many nodes in a cluster. And these nodes are distributed across separate machines but they all belong to the same cluster and work together to accomplish a task. So let's really bring this concept home. So think about a team that you have been a part of, and your team consists of multiple members who all work together to accomplish a common goal. And your team could divide and conquer by assigning each member one 
or multiple roles. And these are the roles that you're going to specialize in. Now, your team members may work in different buildings, but you all still belong to the same team. And this analogy directly applies to nodes in a cluster. For example, nodes are member of a cluster that shares a common goal. And nodes are distributed across separate machines, but they're still part of the same cluster. And nodes are assigned to one or multiple roles. And one of the roles that a node could be assigned to is to hold data. And that is what we'll be focusing on today. So data is stored in Elasticsearch as documents. And a document is a JSON object that contains whatever data you want to store in Elasticsearch. So let's go back to our online grocery shop example. And we're helping our customers search for grocery items online. So we need to store grocery data in Elasticsearch. Now, a document for one grocery item would look like this. In a JSON object, it contains a list of fields or key value pairs. For example, it has the name of the product, the category it belongs in, its brand, and its price. And things are so much easier to find when you group them in a logical manner. And documents that share similar traits and are logically related to each other are grouped into an index. For example, documents of clementines and carrots would be grouped under the produce index. And documents of Malbecs and IPAs would be grouped under wine and beer index. So to sum it up, indices are used to group documents that are related to each other so we know where to find certain information. So let's delve into this a little bit more. So here we have a cluster of nodes and we have a produce index and wine and beer index. And index here is not actually storing documents. It's just a virtual thing that keeps track of where documents are stored. And you can't find index on disk. What actually exists on disk is a shard. So shard is where data is stored, and this is where you run a search. Now, when you create an index, one shard comes with it by default, and you can also configure it so that you could create an index with multiple shards that are distributed across nodes. And this is a practice called sharding, and there are a lot of superpowers that come with this, with this practice. So let's say you have a cluster that looks like this, and you want to create a produce index that will keep track of all produce documents. And when you create an index, one shard is created by default, and the shard is assigned to a node. And remember, shard is where documents are stored, and the number of documents a shard could hold depends on the capacity of the node. So let's say you want to index 600,000 documents in your produce index. But the, uh, the node where this shard is assigned to could only hold 200,000 documents. Well, that's not going to work, right? But we do have two more nodes which could hold 200,000 documents each. So what you can do is you can add two additional shards in the index and distribute them across these nodes. And each shard could hold 200,000 documents, so together, they could hold 600,000 produce documents. Now, that's all fine and dandy, but our produce data is only going to grow. So how are we going to adapt to increasing amount of data? Well, that is the beauty of sharding. So you could add more shards and nodes as the needle rises. So you could horizontally scale and adapt to increasing number of data. But that's not the only superpower that comes with sharding. Now remember, shard is where you store documents and it's also where you run search. So let's talk about a scenario where the client is sending a search request for pink lady apples. And in this scenario, you have one shard in a node that holds the entire produce index. Now let's say the produce index keeps track of 500,000 documents and we're going to run search in this single shard, meaning we'll go through 500,000 documents sequentially. So let's say it takes you 10 seconds to do that. Now, this time, we're going to run the same search with a different setup. So we will have 10 shards distributed across 10 nodes. 
and will distribute 500,000 documents across 10 shards so that each shard holds 50,000 documents each. Now, in the previous scenario, it took us 10 seconds to sequentially search through 500,000 documents. And if you do the math, running a search on 50,000 documents should take one second. And what's so cool about this setup is that you could run a search on all 10 of these shards at the same time in parallel. Now, guess how long it takes to search through 500,000 documents with this setup? One second. So as you can see, sharding could really speed up your search. Now with the first setup, one node had to store all the info and process all incoming search. And with this setup, we could store only store as much data and process search requests as a single machine. And with the second setup, we distributed data across shards and allow shards to process search requests in parallel. So not only do we have the capacity to store more data, we can now search at scale. So let's say everything is going well with our online grocery shop, but all of a sudden, one of our nodes goes down and our data is lost forever. That would suck, right? And we want to avoid this at all costs. So what we could do is we can make copies of the original shards and store its copies across different nodes. So look at nodes one and two, and these nodes contain our original shards, also known as primary shards. And that's what P stands for. And we're gonna make copies of each shard and store these in nodes three and four. And these are known as replica shards. And that is what R stands for. So R0 is a replica shard of primary shard 0, and R1 is a replica shard of primary shard 1. And what this does is that if one node goes down, everything is okay because we have a replica of our data somewhere else. Now, that's not all. There's an additional superpower that comes with replica shards, and that is improving the performance of your search. So let's say you have two primary shards distributed across two nodes, and you're currently getting 2,000 search requests per second. And these search requests are being ran in these two primary shards. And as our app is getting more popular, the search requests have now been increased to 8,000 requests per second. And because of that, your two primary shards are having trouble keeping up with the demand. To solve this, you could add more nodes and increase the number of replica shards of P0 and P1. Now remember, these replicas are identical copies of the primary shards. And with a new setup, these replica shards can pick up the slack and your cluster could better handle increased demands on search. Okay, so now that you understand the basics of Elasticsearch, we're gonna move on to the tutorial and we'll finally get to play with Elasticsearch and Kibana. And the goal of this tutorial is to get familiarized with CRUD operations. So in other words, how do we create, read, update, and delete a document from Elasticsearch? So to do this, we're gonna use Elasticsearch and Kibana. Now, there are multiple options for accessing these two products. One option is to use Elasticsearch and Kibana hosted on Elastic Cloud. And this handles all the heavy lifting of managing the stack, so you can focus on building your product instead. Now, with this, you get a, 30 day, a free 30-day trial, and there's no credit card required, and the trial expires on its own. And I find that for beginners, it's easier and faster to get started on Elastic Cloud. So I'm going to show you how to do that today. Now, another option is to download Elasticsearch and Kibana on your local machine and manage these on your own. And this option is free and there is no expiration date. And I go over the self-managed option in the workshop part two. Okay. So here we have the link to a GitHub repo for today's workshop. So Phoebe, will you drop this link in the chat? Now, thank you. And once you get this, have this pulled up and you'll see this on your screen. So this repo contains 
all the resources that are shared during the workshop. And the slides and recording of this workshop will be included here as well. Now, if you scroll down to the resources section, you'll see the link to free Elastic Cloud Trial. You'll right click on that and open the link in a new tab. And the link will take you to this free trial page. Now, I'm going to breeze over this setup and I don't expect you to set this up during the presentation. I just want to show you what you need to do. So if you want to try this out on your own, you can watch the recording and get started. So to get going, enter your email and click on start free trial. And once you do that, it'll ask you to the email account you signed up with and verify your email. So go to your inbox and click on email from Elastic, then click on verify and accept button. And it'll prompt you to set your password. And once you set your password and log in, it'll take you to this page where you'll click on start your free trial. Next, you'll select the Elastic Stack. And when you do that, you'll see this drop down menu where you can configure your settings. So if you look under select hardware profile, Elasticsearch offers deployment templates for different use cases and workload. And each template selects the appropriate cloud hardware configuration for different needs. But if you're just getting started or don't quite your, uh, know your needs yet, then go with a recommended IO optimized option. Then you would choose a cloud provider of your choice. So let's say you have an app and you want to integrate Elasticsearch into it. So if your app is running on Google Cloud, you don't want Elasticsearch running a different cloud provider because that'll cause latency issues. But for what we're about to do, it doesn't matter which one you choose, just select one. Then select the region close to you and select the latest version of the Elastic Stack, which at the moment is 7.10.1. Now, if you scroll down, you can name your deployment to whatever you want. I named mine Beginner's Crash Course, then click on Create Deployment. And once you do that, you'll get your deployment credentials. And you'll need this when you add data to Kibana. So either download the credentials or save it somewhere else as these are only shown once. And when you click on download or continue without downloading, it'll create your deployment and load Kibana. And once everything is loaded, click on open Kibana. And after that, both Elasticsearch and Kibana are ready to go. And we're going to pull up the Kibana console now. So when you advance to the next page, click on explore on my own option. And it'll take you to this page here. So click on the menu icon in the upper left corner, scroll all the way down to management section and click on DevTools. Then it'll take you to the Kibana console. Now click on this miss and delete the default query shown here. And now we're ready to use Kibana to send requests to Elasticsearch. So before we get to the CRUD operation, let's just take a step back and look at the big picture real quick. So remember, Elasticsearch is a search engine. And when a user sends a request from your website, the request is sent to the server, which sends a search request to Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch will then find the info and sends it back to the server, which processes the info and sends the results back to the browser. Now, the same process can be mimicked and tested with Kibana, which is a UI that communicates with Elasticsearch. And when you deploy an Elastic Cloud, Elasticsearch and Kibana are automatically prepped and ready to go. And the cloud automatically creates multiple nodes that are grouped into a cluster. And as you know, Elasticsearch is receiving search requests and sending the results back all the time. And this communication is handled by HTTP requests. So in the tutorial, we're going to be learning about requests we could send to create, read, update and delete data into Elasticsearch. Okay, so I'm going to get set up here real quick. Give me one sec. Okay, so we're going to have two windows open side by side. So on the left, I have Kibana console open. And on the right, I have the workshop repo.
Now go to this browser where we have our Kibana open. And this is divided into two panels. So on the left is where we enter the request you want to send to Elasticsearch. And on the right is where we'll see the response from Elasticsearch. And we're going to start by checking the health of the cluster. So look to your right to your repo and scroll down to getting information about cluster and node section here. Now, we'll be sending an HTTP request to Elasticsearch, and this is the syntax we're going to use, get, followed by the API that you want to get um, information from, and the parameter that gets you the information that you're looking for. So when you're searching for information about cluster health, you're saying get from cluster API health information about our cluster. So let's copy and paste that into our Kibana console. Make sure to click on it. There's a dark gray bar over it. Then click on this green arrow here to send the information. Now you'll see a response back from Elasticsearch, which tells you the cluster name that has been automatically generated for you. And you'll see that the status is green here, which means that our cluster is healthy. And if you look at line number five, you'll see that we have three nodes that have been automatically created for us. Okay, so next we're gonna get more information about our nodes. So let's scroll down to that section here. And the request we're gonna send is get from nodes API stats about our nodes. So let's copy and paste that. Make sure to click and select and send. Now you'll see that we have a total of three nodes in this cluster. And it'll show you a lot of information like the name, IP address, roles, and attributes, which we're not going to get into right now. But just know that this request is really helpful if you ever have to debug a node because it allows you to inspect the nodes more in detail. Okay, so we're going to move on to the CRUD operation. So in other words, how do we create, read, update, and delete a document? And for this exercise, we're going to store documents about our favorite candy. Now, by now, you know that documents are logically grouped into an index. And as a best practice, we're going to create an index first. So let's go back to our repo, scroll down to create an index section. Now, to create an index, we use the HTTP verb put, followed by the name of the index. And since we're indexing documents about our favorite candy, we're going to use this request right here. Let's copy and paste that into our console, select and send. Now, when you see a response acknowledged true, that means that an index named favorite candy has been successfully created. Okay, so now that we have an index, let's index some documents. And this time I'm using index as a verb to mean that we're storing documents in Elasticsearch. So let's scroll down to index a document section. Now this is C, the create part of a CRUD operation. And when you're indexing a document, you can either use post or put. Now you would use post if you want Elasticsearch to auto-generate an ID for your document. And the syntax you follow is post followed by name of the index, then the document endpoint, and in a JSON object, you put whatever data you want to store here in a key value um, pair. So in our example, what we're saying is post in favorite candy index, the following document, and in the document, I have fields called first name and candy. So let's copy and paste that into our console. Make sure to select it and send. Now you'll see a 201 response here. So what this is saying is an index favorite candy, you have a document with an auto-generated ID that has been created. Okay, so let's turn to your repo and scroll up a little. Now, earlier we said when indexing a document, both HTTP verbs, post or put can be used. Now we just one of our posts, we'll move on to when you would use put to index a document. So let's scroll down to put. 
So you would use put if you want to assign a specific ID to your document. And a time where you might want to use this is when you're indexing data with a natural identifier. For example, let's say you're indexing patient data where each patient has a unique ID. And documents may be easier to work with if it had the same ID as the patient ID rather than some auto-generated ID that has no meaning. So it's easier to keep everything uniform across multiple data sources. So this time, we're going to index a couple more documents using put. So if you look at the repo, the syntax you're going to follow is put name of the index, then document endpoint, and the ID that you want to assign to this document. In a JSON object, you, could, you would put whatever data that you want to store here. So what I'm saying here is put in favorite candy index the following document and assign it an ID of one. So let's copy and paste that. Make sure to select it and send. Now you'll see that document with an assigned ID of one has been created. Now pay attention to this version number here, which is at this point is one. We'll go over what that is in a little bit. Okay. All right. So let's index a couple more documents. So I'm going to copy and paste the previous request twice below. Now I'm going to say assign this document an ID of two. And I'll say Jen's favorite candy is Rolu. I'm going to select the request and send. Now you'll see that document with an ID of two has been created here. Now let's do the third one. I'm going to give this an ID of three. And I'll say Caitlin. Favorite candy is, oh, I'm just gonna guess, uh, sweet tarts. I don't know, am I right? Um, <laughs> okay, and then when I select the request and send, now you'll see that document three has been created. Okay, so now that we have indexed some documents, I wanna send a request to see the content of the document that has been indexed. So this is the read part of CRUD operation. So turn to your repo, scroll down to read part of the repo. And the syntax you're gonna follow is get followed by name of the index, document endpoint, and the ID of the document that you want to retrieve. So for example, we're saying get from favorite index, a document with an ID of one. So let's copy and paste that. And I'm gonna paste it below uh, the request for document one. Make sure to select it and send. Now you'll see that document one has been retrieved. And if you look at line nine, the source field, you'll see the content of the document that we indexed earlier. Okay. So this is a great way to check whether our CRUD operations have worked or not. Now, what do you think would happen if we accidentally index another document with an existing ID? So let's find out. So go back to the request for document with an ID of one. I'm gonna copy and paste that below. Now I'm gonna say that Sally's favorite candy is uh, Snickers. And then I'm gonna, let's say like I accidentally forgot to change this and um, index this document with an existing ID here. Okay. Now this is a little different, right? So instead of 201, you get 200 um, response. And it says document one has been updated. And the version number now is two. So that's not good, right? Um, let me, so let's double check and send a get request to see what exactly happened. So select the get request that we just used and send the request. Now, if you look at line nine source, you'll see that John's information has been replaced with Sally's. So 
this is really not good because when you're indexing data, you don't want to accidentally overwrite your existing document. So in order to prevent that, you could use the create endpoint. So turn to your repo and scroll up to create endpoint section. Now the syntax you use is put followed by name of the index, then create endpoint and the ID that you want to assign to this document here. So what we're seeing here is put in favorite candy index, the following document and assign it an ID of one. But if a document with this ID already exists, then don't do anything, just throw an error. So let's copy and paste that below the get request here. Select and send. Aha, so it's ex working exactly as it should. It's throwing a 4.9 error. And the reason for that on line six is that the document already exists. So the create endpoint provides a safeguard for you so you don't accidentally overwrite your document. Okay. So now let's scroll down to update. Okay. So if you want to, let's see. So there will be times where you want to update an existing document. So for example, let's say Sally originally liked Snickers, but she changed her mind. Her favorite candy now is M&Ms. So let's go back to our repo. And the syntax you're going to use for that is post followed by name of the index, then update endpoint, and the ID of the document that you want to update. Now, in the JSON object, make sure you add doc as a context. And what this is telling you is to only update the fields specified in this inner bracket here. So for our example, we're saying post in favorite candy index, I want you to update a, a document with an ID of one. But please note that I only want to update the field candy with M&Ms. So let's copy and paste that. And I'm going to paste it below Sally's request here. Make sure to select it and send. Now you'll see that document with an ID of one has been updated. Now, one thing that I forgot to go over with you earlier, when we accidentally overwrote John's information, the version number has turned to two. So what this number indicates is how many times a document has been created, updated, or deleted. And since we have created the document with John's information, then accidentally overwritten it with Sally's information, then we intentionally updated it with M&Ms, the version number is now three. So let's just double check and see how everything worked. So scroll down and go to the get request that we sent earlier and send it. And if you look under source, you'll see that Sally's favorite candy is now M&Ms. Okay, so last but not least, what if we wanted to delete a document? So this one is super simple. So go back to your repo. And the syntax that you're going to follow is delete, followed by name of the index, followed by the document endpoint, then the ID of the document that you want to delete. So here we're saying delete from favorite candy index document with an ID of one. So let's copy and paste that and paste it under M&M's request, select and send. Now you'll see that document one has been deleted and the version number now is four. And I'm gonna double check here and send a get request for document one. Now we're getting a 404 error because document one no longer exists. So, okay. So those are all the requests that I've got for you. So when you're doing this alone, I also have 
a take home assignment. So you're going to create an index called places and you're going to pick five of the places that you want to visit after the pandemic is over. And for each place, index a document containing the name of the city and the country. And you'll read each document to check the content of the document, update a field of the document, and delete the document in one place. So I'll be sure to try this at home. Now, I went over a lot. So let me see if we have any questions so far. Do we have anything in the Q&A section? I know uh, Jay's here answering a lot of the questions as we speak. So thank you so much, Jay. Um, let's see, Deb is asking, can you undo back to the previous version? Um, are you talking about? So like when you, um, accidentally overwrote, um, index one with John's candy and that was an accident. Can you do an undo? I don't believe so. That version is there to keep track of everything is, that is happening within the document. Probably to keep the nodes synced. Okay, just wondered. That would be so sweet if you could. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What is the use of bumping up version when a document is being deleted? So again, it's just keeping track of everything is, that is happening within the document. That is the purpose of keeping the version number there. Hey, Lisa, can I add on to that a little bit? Yes, please. So um, as Lisa mentioned earlier uh, in her example, you have replica nodes and primary nodes. And every once in a while, there's a process that comes through that wants to shore up all the data to make sure that your replica nodes and your primary nodes match. So at a point, and by a point, I mean literally seconds or milliseconds in time, you may have your primary node with that document that says deleted and in the replica it could have something different so it has to look at that version number to say okay the fact that this has been deleted is at a newer version so therefore the replica needs to now delete um, that information and then once everything has been synced up that's when that data becomes no longer available when you try to search for it thanks jay <laughs> Okay, so yeah, yeah, the question was about deleting a document, right? Uh, like I know I understood that like when the version is four and it basically assigns that the document is not available the first. So in reality, the document is never actually deleted. Like hard delete is not never happened. I do believe at some point it does get deleted, but you, you don't want to delete it and then there not be a reference that the fact to the fact that it got deleted when the replica nodes go to update because that can cause inconsistencies and then you start getting mismatches in your primary and your replica shards. So it, you have to basically send, it's almost like sending a confirmation or an acknowledgement statement of like, hey, we're gonna delete this. And then once everybody is on the same page, that's when the documents would be deleted. Even yeah. though the delete flag has been raised. So if you tried to search for it while the flag has been deleted, if a primary node tries to pull that information, it will return. No, there's nothing here for that. It's been deleted. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, got it. So yeah, so there'll be a second process like running just to like clear off all these documents, right? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so next question I got. Al asked, can you rec recreate a doc with an ID that was previously that was previously deleted? Let's check it out. So document one has been deleted, right? So we're gonna send this request here. Ta-da! Yes, we can. We just created a document with an ID that has been deleted. Okay, so the sec question, let's see, Jen asked more of a general question. How do the documents get split across the nodes to make searching more efficient? So there isn't a, so you as a developer don't get to control like which documents get stored in which shard or such. So Elasticsearch does that on its own randomly. And the reason why it's so efficient is that it 
is the documents are stored in multiple nodes across different machines and all all the search is happening synchronously at the same time across multiple nodes so that's why it's uh, fast did i explain that clearly i don't think i did did that make sense no yes oh yeah that made sense sorry okay. <laughs> yeah i was wondering like if it does any you know alphabetical things to make it faster or something like that but doesn't yeah. seem so it's just by the scaling mm -hmm. yeah that's exactly the question that i asked when i was first learning about it too so <laughs> okay so let's see what did i does it mean that a document can only be deleted from the primary node first, then sync with the replica? Um, you know what, Jay, do you, do you know how the, this happens? It seems like you know, you know a lot about this. It, it doesn't matter which one is, you know, which one gives the command first. Um, you did mention that there are times where the replica will actually chime in before the primary node, uh, and that helps with performance. That's where it looks for the version difference. Uh, I think there's a question earlier talking about why is there a version number for a deletion call? Um, if there is a conflict, the way that conflict gets resolved is it looks for whatever the latest version number is and would go with that. All right. Amy, and then again, I, once it shows up, it, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> once it shows up, it will try to, it'll rectify that. All right, I don't see any other questions. Going once, going twice. Jeff had a follow-up question there, I think. Um, where, okay, it says, so that could handle a delete, so that could handle a delete then a new create with the same idea, I think, Perhaps so my, Jeff was. Yeah, so my thought there was, you know, we just talked about like deleting a document with one ID and then creating a new one mm -hmm. with the same ID. So in theory, if that happened so fast, like with across like a primary and a replicant, mm -hmm. um, then it's just going to, look to see whatever has the newest ID and resolve it in that way. So like, so if a although I. I highly doubt that would happen that like someone would delete and create at the same time and they might be same ID, like ID of five on a replica and ID of five on a primary. Right. Synced yet. <laughs> that was like my thought process there. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So let's actually I have a few announcements. Okay. So if you like this workshop, we have more in the series for you from the Elastic side. So on your screen, you'll see a link to a GitHub repo. And this repo contains a table of contents for all the workshops that have taken thus, uh, taken place thus far. And you could access all the videos, presentation, and resources to move forward. And we do have part three in the workshop series coming up this coming Wednesday, February 24th at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. And Phoebe will, oh, she already did it. She's amazing. She dropped the event link in the chat just in case you wanted to RSVP. Now the part three workshop does build on workshop part two. So be sure to get caught up on it if you want to attend this workshop. Okay, now if you have Sherry asks, what happened to part two? So part two actually already happened uh, on Elastic uh, Bevy event platform. And I have a video recording along with a GitHub repo in the table of contents link that Phoebe just shared. So if you wanted to uh, move forward with that, then you could do so. Okay. Okay. So now, if you have any questions about Elastic, the last the discussion forum is a great place to get your questions answered. So we have a community of developers and developer advocates that answer questions on this platform. So feel free to post your questions here. And last but not least, uh, I often blog about Elasticsearch. So if you prefer to learn by reading instead, be sure to check out my blog. 
Okay, Jeffrey asks, are these the same as the boot camp starting on March 30th? Yes, you're absolutely correct. So the first workshop of the boot camp is the identical one that I just given you guys today. So if you don't want to attend like the part three next week and rather go into this boot camp instead, start with workshop part two. Also, Lisa, the yeah. part one and part two of the boot camp series um, is Lisa's uh, part one and part two for beginners crash course. But the third part will be Jay yeah. presenting about how to create a diversity orgs uh, app using Elastic App Search. So you'll spin up a quick React app and then you'll uh, you'll create a search within that app and it's really cool. So I highly recommend uh, checking that one out as well. And, and the, the App Search is a part of the Elastic Stack. Um, it's, I, I tell people it's more of the lightweight, You're, you wanna get people searching and finding data quickly this is how you get off the ground and uh, get off the ground running. And the uh, the demo app that we're building is actually in production and used by companies all over the world to my fear <laughs> at this point. <laughs> yeah, so you get a whole picture. So you really understand what Elasticsearch and Kibana are under the hood and go over all of these query queries that are going on the background with uh, the app search and the app that Jay will be showing you in the third workshop of the bootcamp series. So make sure to check that out. And yeah, well, that's a wrap for me. So thank you so much for listening.